Praise the Lord. Um, we might uh, read our scripture first this morning, and then um, we will stand and, and ask the Lord again for um, His Word this morning. So this morning, um, Brother Tyler, you can come. Um, I want us all to turn to Nehemiah chapter 5. Uh, <clears throat> Nehemiah chapter 5. And there there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. For there were those who said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. There were also those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is, at, is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And indeed, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. And I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, Each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them, and I said to them, According to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren, who were sold to the nations. Now indeed, will you even sell your brethren, or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. Then I said, What you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of God? because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies. I also, with my brethren and my servants, am lending them money and grain. Please, let us stop this usury. Restore now to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses. Also a hundredth of the money and the grain, the new wine and the oil that you have charged them. So they said, we will restore it and will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Then I called the priests and required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. Then I shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise. Even thus may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. Then the people did according to this promise. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor, in the land of Judah from the 20th year until the 32nd year, King Artaxerxes, 12, year, uh, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions, but the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Indeed, I also continued to work on this wall and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work. And at my table were 150 Jews and rulers, besides those who came to us from the nations and around us. Now that which was prepared daily was one ox and six choice sheep. Also fire were prepared for me, and once every 10 days in abundance of all kinds of wine. Yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provisions because the bondage was heavy on this people. Remember me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. Amen. Let us stand. Father, Lord, we thank you again for this morning. Lord, I know you want to speak, Lord. And I know you want to touch people here this morning. I just ask, Lord, that help me to get out of the way, Lord, and speak for a few words this morning, Lord. Let your word come forth. Let it pierce hearts this morning, Lord. And uh, Lord, I ask that um, this message will have a lot of fruit, a lot of fruit for you, Lord. I pray, Lord, uh, against any attempt that Satan might have to, to have to distract any heart, any mind in this place, Lord. Grip them, I pray, Lord, and allow, help us all to focus on your word this morning. We thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know whether um, you are tired of Nehemiah by now, but uh, I, I hope you are, can still um, come with me through, through this book. Um, I have maybe uh, one more message after this one, and then the walls are complete, and I think then the burden will lift. Um, but uh, 
today's message, I think, is, uh, is a very important one. Um, and I, I said this morning to, to Brother Levi, I said, you know, some chapters of, of the scriptures, um, I feel you can almost just read them. You don't have to say much. Um, and if you really read this closely, uh, it really speaks so much, and it's hard to um, preach much more than what this chapter actually talks about. But I believe that uh, God has uh, given me His heart, and I want to communicate some of these things that in this chapter is really, really important. I don't know whether uh, little uh, Amelia is still with us with that song, but I, I believe that song was, was a prophetic song this morning. I'm sure she didn't know what I was going to talk about today, um, but uh, without you, I'm, I'm restless. And, and a lot of this chapter, I, you know, the title of my message is God is the comforter of, of His people. And I believe this morning, God wants to comfort us. And I will, I will talk about why in this chapter. Remember the, the bigger picture um, in the book of Nehemiah and why the Holy Spirit has brought us to this book. Um, from the very beginning, it was this idea of restoring fellowship, but in particular, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And that was specifically regarding holiness and um, this uh, separation of God's people from the world. Uh, seeing God's uh, truth, seeing His word, seeing what He says to us, and separating ourselves from the world unto Him, and drawing the line at our homes, of our families, and in this church with regards to doing His will rather than what the world says or everybody else says. And we wanted to restore holiness in our lives, where it's not just about being clean. Uh, holiness is not just about being clean. It's about belonging to the Lord, being His. And... Um, it is in this place where holiness is restored to the people of God, where there's a clear distinction between clean and unclean, between the holy and the profane, where God uh, is pleased to dwell with His people, and reality from heaven enters the city. Uh, whenever God was pleased, the presence of God filled the temple. And this is in the New Covenant, we are, we are the temple of God. We are the very uh, place where God comes and dwells. Wherever we gather, whether it be two or three, God promises to be in our midst. Amen? And we want to see that rebuilt. We want to see that restored fully. And we see that, as I said from the very beginning, that it is the walls that has be, takes the longest to restore, the gates that takes the longest to rebuild, and it faces the most opposition. Because without holiness, nobody will see the Lord. Without holiness, there cannot be any reality uh, in the kingdom of God and in His people. So this is crucial. And, and Satan knows that you can see as we, we spoke last week, that the more and more the breaches are being closed in our lives, uh, then you know, Satan panics and he becomes more and more aggressive and he intensifies his uh, persecution of the people of God to do one thing, and that is for you to stop rebuilding, to stop restoring, to stop the work of the Lord. Um, and so last week, um, the chapter was about external opposition. External opposition that's trying to, to uh, discourage us, to produce unbelief in us, to try to scare us, produce fear in us, and all of that to bring confusion and to bring a halt to the work. This morning the Lord, at least at first, wants to talk about to us about internal opposition, internal strife, strife that exists between brother and brother, sister and sister. And uh, we see here in this chapter what, what happened here. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of some of the laws in Deuteronomy, and I don't want to spend much time of it, but <clears throat> we have an outcry here uh, as they are rebuilding the walls. You know, there's a lot of people who come from Babylon. Remember, they came out of Babylon, and, you know, um, and a lot of them that came left a lot of uh, their wealth and things for, to come to Jerusalem. Some of them were able to purchase uh, some land 
Um, others have, you know, are, 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 are struggling to, to make it by, uh, to make ends meet. Um, and uh, because there is so much dedication to the rebuilding of the city, um, not a, a lot of people don't have uh, had adequate time to spend in their fields to farm and to grow a crop and heal uh, of food. Um, and we see that in verse 2, there are, this, there are all these cries, from verse 2, there's all these cries that are coming um, to, to Nehemiah. Um, and uh, some are just simply crying because it's a famine. It's, it's, it, there isn't a lot of food available and they are starving to death. But as these uh, verses go on, from verses 1 to 6, as these verses go on, the story becomes much bleaker than just a famine. And we start seeing that there is excessive taxes on the people and that some of these uh, families had to mortgage the fields they've built, they, they, they have, the fields and vineyards they have. And what they've done is, uh, <clears throat> when you're in a place where you can't make use of your field, you would lend your field to uh, someone who were uh, more wealthier than you, that had the resources to actually cultivate the land and to bring forth crop. And they were lending these uh, fields out to their brothers. Um, and these men were using their fields and uh, ex ex uh, demanding interest uh, for their work, not just uh, uh, fair pay, and then people were getting in such difficult positions because now they had to pay these people for the field they were borrowing. They were not getting sufficient supplies from that. And so in, in, in Deuteronomy, your last option was to sell uh, your family members into slavery to work for them so that you could have food. And this was happening between brothers and between families in Jerusalem. Now Deuteronomy was very clear. Deuteronomy said that you are never allowed to uh, exact interest from your fellow Israelite, from your fellow brother or sister. Uh, this was business that could happen between uh, uh, other nations, but Jerusalem and how we treated one another ought to be completely different. They were not uh, to see their brother or sister's uh, 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 state as an opportunity to uh, gain, as an opportunity to make money, as an opportunity to increase their wealth. And so rather than a lot of these nobles and a lot of these uh, wealthier brothers, rather than helping these people, they were uh, seeing this as an opportunity to make more wealth Imagine this, as, as everybody is in the work, as rebuilding the walls of, of, of Jerusalem, which benefits the nobles, which benefits everyone, at the same time, they, these people that were helping and laboring and doing the work, they were putting on these heavy burdens upon them and upon their families by even making it difficult for them to have food or something to eat. Um, and obviously when Nehemiah hears this, there, there, he is, as, as it says, he's very, very angry. Now, I know that we have seen extremes of this in Western Christianity. Of course, you know, we read Nehemiah and although some of these things perhaps even takes place on a physical scale, I think we've seen that in, in the West, this, this, this prosperity gospel has, is, is, is guilty of, of taking people who are in need and using them, seeing them as an opportunity to increase wealth in the church, an absolute abomination. In fact, the prophet speaks about, uh, Jeremiah uh, uh, says, woe to those shepherds who feed themselves uh, Ezekiel speaks about the same thing, about shepherds who feed themselves and who, 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 who use the flock as a means of gain. Ezekiel goes on in Ezekiel 34 to talk about how the fat sheep, not just shepherds, how, but how the fat sheep misuses the lean sheep. And how uh, certain 
uh, parts of Israel who are wealthy or well off are oppressing those who are in need. And I, I tell you, this is obviously something we have seen, the extremes of these things in the church. We've seen this happen, uh, where people are taken advantage of. And, and we, we see the abuse uh, that the gospel, even in the New Testament, Paul talks about how they, they will use godliness as a means of gain. Uh, Peter says they will make merchandise out of you. That th they will see these uh, things as opportunities to enrich themselves. Um, but for us this morning, I, I, don't, I know you've, you've probably looked at these things many, many times in terms of all the abuse that's out there, but I want to speak to us and, and see the, the, the principle, the problem here that will prevent us as, as, a, as a church to, to rebuild and restore, to make sure that none of these internal oppositions exist, none of this internal strife will be found in our midst. And, and uh, you can see here that the principle here is, is that these people, these nobles, these people, they saw themselves as people who have a right to be served, a right to take rather than to give. They, they saw their position and what they have as a position just to receive. And they did not look at their position. They did not look at themselves as somebody to, that is uh, to be a blesser or a giver or a servant. Now, they, they wanted to be served. They, they wanted to get things out of, out of this, this whole restoration. And um, I, I want to tell you, I, I think, as, as Paul says to the Ephesian church in uh, uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 35, he says, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Amen? Amen? These principles is in, is, is, is in, in the world where everybody fights for himself, everybody enriches himself, everybody makes sure that whatever opportunity he gets, he will put himself first. Right? That's, that's how it was in the world. That's what before we came to Christ, that was our taskmasters. That's how things work in the world. But in the, in the house of God, it is upside down. It's the other way around. It's about being the least. It's about being a servant. It's about being a blesser. It's about being a giver. Amen? That's, that's what God is looking for in all of us. You see, here again, it's about what I can do for me, what I can do for my family. What, what, and, and it doesn't matter if I trample over others to get it. It doesn't matter. And brothers and sisters, this morning, just the, the Lord wants to speak to us in these last days. It is so important that we continue to have a love for one another and consider each one better than ourselves and to serve, have a servant heart, brothers and sisters, and to see that all of us are in this together. That when you, by trampling anyone or putting, putting yourself above anyone, does hinders the work of God in our midst. And uh, there are going to become people, and this is, this is really important, when there are people needy that come into our midst, or there are people needy in our midst. You know, John says something amazing. He says in his letter, he says, if you see your brother in need, and you do not help him, you do not know God. Neither have you seen him. And I, I believe in this, 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 this uh, restoration, God has to uh, break and, 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 and help us uh, renew our minds and help us to repent from a, a, a life where we only care about ourselves and our own families. And we can see that how we minister to others. When people are going to come in our midst and who are needy, very, very needy, God is going to bless a Jerusalem that is willing to serve and minister and give, brothers and sisters. Wherever there is uh, 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 distinctions, and this is what we're going to get to in now, 
Whenever there's distinctions between rich or poor, between the knowledgeable and the, the, the people who are not knowledgeable, between those who are uh, as a position and those who don't have a position, whenever there's some kind of inequality in Christ, in the house of God, God cannot bless it. God cannot honor that. And the work of Christ will be hindered. And, you, you know, this is something really, really important that we, you have to help all of us. You have to help us as elders to maintain this uh, uh, unity that we talk about it even on, on Wednesday prayer night, to preserve this unity as we seek to rebuild these walls. May there be no distinctions uh, uh, that separates people based upon their state or their position, brothers and sisters. Really, really important. There will be a lot, a lot of need in these last days. And it will be, you know, might be different things. And we, we will look at them now. But I tell you, God is looking for a, a people who is willing to be servants in these last days. To humble themselves, to lower themselves. You know, this, this ministry of John the Baptist before, and I think it's a principle, he, he, he's a picture of, of preparing people's hearts before the Messiah comes, before Jesus comes. Amen? He's a picture of that. And one of the things that he says he came to do was to bring the low places down and the valleys to lift them up. To, to bring everybody on an equal standing. And, and where there is this, this equality, there is where Christ comes. Amen. Where people do not look at themselves as better than others, but we all look at ourselves as those who are in need of a Savior, in need of Christ, in need of His grace. And brothers and sisters, that's what we need in the last days. Amen. Amen. There is a lot of abuse in, in the church today. And we, we, we want to stand against these things. But my heart of my message is in verses, is, is really how Nehemiah responds in verses uh, 14 to 19. We know he, in, in, in uh, verses 7 to 13, he, he confronts them and he puts them up before the assembly. And it's a, he, he, he asks of them to repent, to restore this, uh, this uh, uh, things that they've taken from, from their own brothers and sisters to stop this oppression and then pronounces a, a judgment over anyone who continues to do these things. And, you know, he, he gives a, a sign of shaking out his, like his pocket and he pronounces a judgment, very strong language about people who, mis who uses God's people as a means of gain. I, I, you know, he mentions the fear of God a number of times in this chapter. And I tell you, this is one of the things that is missing for so many men who are preaching, who are teaching, who are in ministry today, who are, who are using the people of God. I tell you, this is a huge warning. You know, even, and this is not old covenant language. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, about those people who were troubling the Galatians, who wanted the Galatians to go back underneath the law because they were looking for, for followers. They wanted to draw these people to themselves. And Paul says, I wish these people will be cut off. They, 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 they are who trouble you. Cut them off. And I, the, 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 this language is not just for the Old Testament. Those who, who misuse the people of God for their own gain, Brothers and sisters, this is a, a, a very terrible sin, and God will not have any of it. And, you know, this is even as a principle with God, how the West are, you know, we, we cannot come to God to use Him for things. Uh, God is not going to be used. Even Jesus Himself in John chapter 2, He didn't entrust Himself to people because He knows what was in their hearts. He knew whether some people were actually serious about following Him or not. And in our midst, one of the things that we want to discern is when people come in, are they interested in Christ or do they just want to use us because they want a better you know, temporal life or they want some help here or there? Or are they actually interested in Jesus? And I've said this before, the principle, those who are interested in Jesus, I'm interested in them. But um, we are not, we're not, we're not uh, uh, center link here. We're preaching the kingdom of God. We're preaching salvation. 
Amen. Yes, we, we, we want to help the poor. As the Scripture says, we want to help the poor. But that's not apart from the message of the Gospel. And so, in these last days, are you ready to be a family? Are you ready to be the household of God? Are you ready to look the person right next to you in the eye and say, Brother, sister, I'm going to be here and we're going to walk this together. If you're in need, call me. If I'm in need, I'm going to call you. You know, this, this is practical, brothers and sisters, because where this fellowship exists, where this transparency, this honesty, this reality exists, God is going to bless the church with His presence, and the work of God will continue, and the walls will be rebuilt. But if there is opposition in our midst, that's always going to hinder the work of the Lord. But Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah, I always say Jeremiah for Nehemiah. I think I'm, I always, I, I'm drawn to Jeremiah, I think. <laughs> but uh, Nehemiah, in it is really this chapter is a picture, is two different pictures. He responds, and, and in verses 14 to 19, we see um, an example, he, he, the example that he gives. A beautiful picture where he talks about the fact that um, not only did he get rid of this oppression, but he is uh, humbling himself. He's not taking government, governor allowances that's due him, that is his right. He's not taking that because he does not want to burden people. And he invites everyone to his home. He also doesn't stand off from, 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 from the work. He's, he's constantly laboring. He doesn't uh, acquire any land, but he works at the wall. He lets all his servants work. And at his table, he invites everybody who is willing to come, to come and have food. A, a great picture. A great picture for us. But church, instead of looking at Nehemiah this morning, I think we have somebody far better to look at this morning. His name is Jesus. You know, um, there is this beautiful verse in Philippians that would already summarize so much of what I have said in Nehemiah. In Nehemiah, uh, in Philippians 1, verse 27 to 29, it has, it's a beautiful verse. If I can uh, say it verbatim, it, it goes like this. Only let your uh, 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 manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Christ. So when I come to see you or am absent, I might hear uh, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Uh, and then he goes on to say, um, uh, and in nothing be, be frightened because of your opposition. Uh, and it says, for this is clear to them uh, that, uh, for this is clear uh, to them. Who can, who can read the, the passage? I'm going to try and, uh, Philippians 1, 27, 28. For this is clear to them that, that, I think he says that this is their destruction, but for you it's salvation. Read, uh, who can stand up and read loud for us? Philippians 1, 27, 28. Only conduct yourselves in a manner. Worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whenever I come and see you to remain ab uh, see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm Amen. in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Yes, Lord. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. Amen. Amen. And then he goes on to say, For it has been granted to you uh, for his sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer with him. That, that is a summary of a lot of what, I've sh of what I shared. But then he goes into Philippians 2 and he starts to talk about this harmony that should exist in the body of Christ. And then he goes on to Christ coming down, emptying himself. And that, this is our example. And here you have in Nehemiah, Nehemiah is, is, has all these rights. He has, all, he has this position as governor. And he is lowering himself. 
He is lowering himself uh, to meet people's needs. He's not taking advantage of people, but rather even rights that he does have, he lays them down in order to minister and to serve. He doesn't see his position of honor as a title to, to, to receive something, but rather as a responsibility to give something, church. And Jesus, you know, it's always amazing when I meditate on this, that God, he was uh, the one who was all sufficient in himself. He didn't need anything. And he came down. He emptied himself, as Philippians 2 says. He emptied himself and he came among us, church to minister and to be a servant, even a servant unto death. Unto death. And I, I believe that in, in this chapter, there's a number of things here that are practical things that the Lord wants to speak to us about. Um, that these distinctions should not exist in our midst. And uh, how we are to look to Christ and imitate Him. Amen. We see in this chapter in Nehemiah, Nehemiah obviously had a lot of wealth. He was very rich. But there was someone who's even richer, and his name is Jesus. He was there sitting with his father in all glory and all riches, and he came down and he became poor for us, to enrich us. Amen? And in, in the, you can apply this in our, in our, in our midst and a couple of things, brothers and sisters. Obviously, there's the physical. There's the physical reality of the, the, the reality where some of us have been blessed materially. But we are never ever to allow our material blessings to become something that lifts us up. You see, it's so important to see here that we are one body. We are to be one mind and one spirit. Amen? Anything that causes division or distinction in the body of Christ causes opposition to the harmony and work of the Spirit in our midst. And those who, who, who are wealthy, who has a, a lot of money, are not to see, make that a, a point of division, but rather let it be something that are given to the Lord to serve the body of Christ. Amen? This is what Nehemiah does. He, he doesn't... Uh, uh, allows his, his wealth to, first of all, be a burden on others, but also then his own personal wealth, he gives to others. He blesses people. He makes his wealth a blessing rather than something to uh, distinguish himself and uh, draw attention to himself. All right, so this is really important. Christ, he, he did exactly the same thing for us. He is our better Nehemiah. I said this before, Nehemiah put, uh, is portrayed by, by uh, uh, Jesus so many times. He, uh, Jesus is our builder, our overseer, and he is helping us facilitate this. And Jesus wants to get rid of any internal strife, any distinctions, any of this. And he says, follow me. Look at me, follow me. Amen. So Jesus, who was rich, became poor for us. Now, it's not just in physical things, brothers and sisters. Some of us, maybe uh, we have walked with the Lord for far longer. We, we, we know the Lord more. Uh, God, we have more of His treasures stored up in our hearts and minds. And this is also not something that our, we are to uh, allow distinctions in our midst. Uh, I don't want any cliques in the church. I don't want certain people only speaking to certain people. Uh, we want to see harmony between all of you. Amen. I don't care if somebody has walked with the Lord for 50 years and somebody has walked with the Lord for two months. Let those who know more, let those who are more enriched, lower yourself. Be able to enter into fellowship with that person. Lower yourself. In fact, See what you have as a responsibility to give and enrich and lift others up next to you. This is what Christ has done. Think about the God who knows everything, who understands everything, came, walked amongst us, and was walking with these men and teaching them daily. What He lowered Himself. He allowed Himself to be in fellowship with, the, with these mere men. Every day, I am amazed that the God of all, you know, he, he, man, how much knowledge, how much wisdom, and I can enter into fellowship with Him. This is, this is who God is. 
This is how Jerusalem ought to be. This is how, how the church ought to be. There ought to be no distinctions, no divisions, no internal strife. Amen? We cannot allow any of our positions. You know, God, the Son of God, the King of glory. Yet, who had to teach? Who had to teach the disciples about washing feet? Who lowered himself? Who, who went and, 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 and uh, instigated that? It was the Son of God who has all the titles, who has the position of authority, everything. Yet he became the lowest and became a servant among us, brothers and sisters. Uh, cul culture differences. Who was the one who broke culture differences? You know, I, I, I say uh, a couple of times through the book of Nehemiah that if we read through the book of Nehemiah, don't, don't get confused because it speaks about the nation's being our, our enemies, that God is against the nations. You see, uh, it's just those who, who, who wanted to do harm and destroy Jerusalem. You see, in an, uh, at Nehemiah's table, there, there were people from the nations who came to his table that were feeding at, come and, 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 and he was feeding them at his table. And, you know, this is again, brothers and sisters, if the, uh, we are um, a true United Nations here, we have about 23 different nationalities, uh, and we are not al to, you know, we are very different. Um, and I'm, I'm always reminded of that when I have different brothers over, different cultures. Um, my, my dad, having stayed with me for a while, he has had a, a lot of people over and has heard uh, from, from different cultures what people eat, and he's still getting over it. Um, he <laughs> can't believe what people are eating. <laughs> but the point is, Brothers and sisters, we, we are different in our cultures and we, we, we are going to rub each other uh, uh, up the wrong way. But, you know, Jesus, who came into that environment where the, the Jews had a, a self-righteousness, they thought that because they are Jewish, they, 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 are, they earn the favor of God, that he came and he was the one who, who we heard this morning, who went to Samaria. He was the one who, who ministered to the Syrophoenician women. He was the one who, who, who ministered to the Roman centurions. And, and I, I don't want uh, any of these distinctions to exist in our midst. I don't want just the Romanians to meet with the Romanians. Amen? I don't want the Indians just to meet with the Indians. I don't want the South Africans just to meet with the South Africans. And I, I mean, I, I was going to say Australian, but I think we only got one Australian, so that's, that's, he can meet with himself. <laughs> that's not going to work. This is, all these things, there's some things we have to do, it's intentional, brothers and sisters. It's intentional. Go out of your comfort zone. Go out of your comfort zone. Invite people to your home that, uh, you, that are different to you. But are unified in Jesus with you. Jesus is making new, you, one new man. He's not saying, you know, you know, as a South African, I'm not saying, okay, Lord, you know, I can see the Romanians, they need a lot of grace. I can see the Indians, they need a lot of grace. I can see the, the Finnish people, they need a lot of grace. I can go on. Can you please make them like my, me? No, I need to change too. Jesus is saying that there's something wrong here. We all, Jesus is making one new man in this room. Yet while there's many nations, God is making one new person, Jesus Christ. Amen? And culture differences. Uh, look, I, I, I might step on, on, on toes this morning, but I'm going to do it. I am completely against especially in a, in a country uh, like Australia, to, to have something like a Romanian church or an Indian church or anything like that. Because the gospel is about bringing everyone together in Christ. We're not to glorify a language. We are not to glorify a culture. We're not to glorify our ways or our traditions. If any of these things come in the way of the work of Christ, they are hindrances and obstacles, not blessings. But I do believe when we come together, our differences can become a blessing. I've been blessed by you brothers, Romanian brothers. I've been blessed by the Indian brothers. They have something that I don't have. I am blessed 
but it is in Christ and it is not when we lift our differences up, but rather allowing Christ to unify us when these things become a blessing. Amen? This is really important. And I, I, this is where always internal strife can, is, is, uh, you know, can exist in these areas. Nehemiah, even under the old covenant, allowed from the nation's people to sit at his table. Wow! Can you imagine? To feed at his home? And Jesus, you know how they, they hammered him for, for, for eating with different kinds of people. And here's another one. You know, people might come into our midst and they, you know, they come from a very sinful background. Jesus ate with a lot of sinners, didn't he? People from sinful backgrounds who were interested in him and he went and he ate at their home and he fellowshiped with them. He was able not to, to, to look down at them or to treat them uh, differently, but to still offer the truth to them and to minister to them and not see himself as above that. Amen? This is something that is also can easily exist in our midst in a society that is spiraling morally. More and more, if we are, want to preach the gospel, if we want to minister to others, and people, come and, 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 and we, people are going to have a lot of baggage, a lot of baggage, a lot of different things, are we ready to be able to at least be willing not to compromise? None of this is about compromise. None of this is about, about changing the truth for them, but saying, look, the Lord saved me. I was in need of the cross. I was in need of His grace. And I'm going to offer this to this person. I can, I, can, I, can, I can lower myself to this person. I can go down to Him. You see, the heart of this chapter for me is about being a servant and not wanting to be served. And I tell you, if, if there's anything that it, the, the Western church needs to op- wake up, and the whole way we set up church, the whole way church is done, is people come to the church to receive, to receive, and they go, they live their lives in every meeting, and everything that is done with religion is not to give, not to bless, but is to receive, as to be served. Rather than if you really read what Jesus from the beginning said, if you're His disciple... In His kingdom, it's about serving. It's about giving. It's about being a blessing, brothers and sisters, because God will supply us with, us, with every need that we have. And we are, do not have to draw attention to ourselves. We do not have to worry about uh, uh, enriching ourselves, for we are rich already because we have Him. Amen? He is our, he's our uh, treasure. And it's about now ministering to others, brothers and sisters. Now you can see the heart of Nehemiah here in in this chapter. Nehemiah, I believe, when he was doing this work, the the Lord, the the Holy Spirit fell upon him. And I I believe the Lord was was ministering his heart through Nehemiah as they were rebuilding the the, the work in Jerusalem. As they were rebuilding, uh, Nehemiah was, was, was being led by the Holy Spirit. And the reason why I titled my message as um, that God is our comforter is because this morning I, I believe that uh, many of you need, need comforting this morning. Because Nehemiah, he saw that and he heard this cry. He heard this cry that a lot of people were burdened, were being absolutely burdened Yes, by internal strife, but even in the previous chapter, in chapter 4 from uh, uh, verses 10 onwards, there is this saying that goes in in Jerusalem that those who are carrying the burdens are losing their strength. Their their strength is fading. And I, I, I believe that many of us, and there can be a number of reasons why we we carry these these burdens. And God wants to minister that this morning. He wants to comfort us this morning because what we see here with Nehemiah is he's willing to uh, everything that he has and it is in his power to comfort Jerusalem, to comfort the people who are oppressed, to, to, to those who are in need, to touch them and to provide to them and to give them what they need. And Jesus wants to do the same this morning. Amen. 
And that beautiful passage in Matthew 11 where Jesus says, Come to me all you are who are labor and who are heavy laden, for I will give you rest. I will give you rest. And here was a cry in Jerusalem, a huge cry in Jerusalem. A lot of people were burdened. They were hungry. They were scared. They were afraid. There was, there was conflict outside. There was strife inside. And Nehemiah here represents the heart of God that wants to answer this cry and minister to these burdens. You know, 1 John tells us, 1 John says to us that if we love God, we, for this is the love of God, to keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Burdensome. We, we in, 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 when you are in a place of being burdened, and the reason why I say this, and I was, when I was this morning in, 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 in my office, I felt this when I was praying. I felt this in my heart. And I have, you know, be, been around with so many of you. There's a lot of heaviness in a lot of people. And um, as you see, as the building continues, this is something that is often talked about, these burdens that are carried in, in Jerusalem. Um, and we see, obviously, this ministering, this, this ministering is about helping others and serving others, and we, and we want to, to have those principles. But maybe this morning, you are heavily burdened. And I want you to know that there is a comforter. There is one who comforts his people. But in chapter 4, people were burdened because of uh, all the distractions, all the threats outside, all the fear-mongering, all the things that were said outside, and they were burdened because of this. The work became hard because their, their eyes was no longer on Christ, their eyes was no longer on the task, their eyes was on what was happening around them, and they became very, very heavy in doing the work of the Lord. Um, this is maybe where some of you are at, that, that you, where you are, you know, in your circumstances, it's just, it's just you're, you're feeling a pressing from all sides around you, and you have taken your eyes of, of, of the task ahead of, of Christ, and you're, you feel your strength is fading. <coughs> maybe for others, when our focus is on one another, when our focus is on one another, if there has been any internal strife in the church, and there are, there are problems, we have problems in our hearts with brothers or sisters, they can always produce a heaviness in our hearts, a burden in our hearts. I speak to any brother who has a problem with another brother or sister, there is a burden there. They're carrying it, and unless there is peace made, unless it's addressed, unless God resolves that, that thing carries them and it weighs heavy on their hearts the whole time. The whole time. There needs to be, as Nehemiah does here, there needs to be a time where we confront that and we address that. Church, can I, I want to be honest with you this, this morning. Please do not be, we do not want any uh, of this in our midst. Do not be so foolish to think that if you have some problems in your heart with others, other people in the church, and you just leave it, you never address it, that you will have peace, that you will have comfort, that you can continue to build. You will have a heaviness in your heart, and it, it, there, will, there will be no fellowship, no fellowship in the church, and no fellowship with God. Many, many times when, when, when people start to withdraw, I know that this often because there's something has happened horizontally. Something has happened between us. And this morning, if there needs to be a resolving of that, brothers and sisters, the Bible says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. We see here Nehemiah, he's a peacemaker. And maybe some of you are, you know, you have things in your heart that you need to go and speak to that person. You need to go and tell him right now, after this meeting, don't wait. Say, you know what, I need to say this. I need to get this off my heart. I need to make peace today. Amen? 
This is, if we are want to be a family, we cannot have this in our, in, in our midst. We need to, to be free of that. For others, the burden is there. The things that you are carrying is because it's, it's, it's things that you should be giving to the Lord. You're burdened about so many things like, like Martha was. You are worried about uh, 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 your uh, situation with work. You are worried about your, even your spiritual condition. You know how many I speak to? They're worried about their spiritual condition. I should be there. I, I, should, be, I should be far more uh, full of the Spirit. I, I, I should have overcome this thing already. I should be, you know, why? I look at that brother. Look at him. He's, he's, he's flying. Well, why am I like this? But brothers and sisters, and then they carry that and they just continue to condemn themselves. Can I, can I encourage you, if, if you're in that place where you, you this is, this is this discouragement, but you're carrying this thing, can you give that to Christ this morning? Do not carry, this is a burden you're never supposed to carry. If indeed you're, you're not satisfied for where you are and you're comparing yourself with others, brothers and sisters, this is something you need to repent of. And then come to Jesus. He's the only one who can fix that. Repent of the things you know you need to change. It doesn't help you worry about Him. It doesn't help you're always uh, downcast about that. Change. Turn around. Change. Start changing. Don't condemn yourself and carry these things all the time. All the time. Brothers and sisters, uh, these burdens... Satan loves to put on the people of God. He loves to throw us, put a heaviness over us. Because in that place, we don't have any joy. We don't praise God. We don't have zeal. We don't want to work for God. And, and, and this place brings us to, to just an, an, an utter place of, of idleness. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? This is really important. A lot of you, you know, and I've said this now probably for a number of weeks, but you come in and you're heavy. Why? Don't you know that Jesus says, come to me? If you're heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. He says, I am gentle. I am lowly in heart. Learn from me. My yoke, if you're carrying the yoke of Christ, is easy. My burden is light. My commandments are not burdensome because I will give you the grace. I will pour out my Holy Spirit upon you. I will empower you. I will strengthen you. You are, do not have to uh, be on your own. We see here in, in, in the Old Covenant, uh, I think a picture here in this chapter of the Old Covenant. In, in the Old Covenant, yeah, it, 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 it is always it is by our own uh, power, our own strength. But when Jesus comes, he comes, he brings a new covenant like Nehemiah. He brings us rest. He brings us to his table. He brings us, he makes us one. And he will give us everything we need. Come to Jesus. Come to his table this morning. Don't carry your own burdens. Don't try and do this uh, uh, life where, you know, you're just constantly absorbed with yourself. Brothers and sisters, this is, to me, a lot of you, when I speak to you, this is, there is this heaviness about you, and you're carrying these burdens um, when you have Jesus there, who says, come to me, come to me. He is the comforter. He's the one who can comfort you. He's the one who can lift that burden. You know what it said, Jesus said about the Pharisees? He said, you place these heavy burdens on people, but you won't lift them with one finger. Jesus is not like that. Jesus doesn't give us this, this new covenant life and says, you know what? You're on your own. You have Christ. You have Him. And He will walk with you every step of the way. He will empower you and He will give you the grace you need, brothers and sisters. There is a comforter in Jerusalem. And even in the midst of all the opposition and conflict outside, strife inside, it doesn't matter how difficult it is. Learn from these Jewish brothers. They started to cry out. And Nehemiah listened. 
How much more, if you cry out this morning, will God listen to you? How much more? Don't be silent. How many of you want a touch from the Lord today? How many of you are tired, tired of dragging your feet? Tired of carrying some things that you say, you know what? I should have given this to the Lord a long time ago. Why am I still struggling with it? Why do I still carry these things in my heart? Is this the day? Today Jesus is inviting you. Today, come to him. Take whatever is on your shoulders and give it to him this morning. I don't know what it is, brothers and sisters. I don't know what is in your life. I don't know what it is. But clearly in this chapter we could see some people were struggling with, they just didn't have food. It was, it was problems with work. It was problems with their, 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 their way of, of making life, right? Others had problems because they were internal conflict. They were problems between one another. Others had problems with, with government taxes. Everybody seemed to have problems. But Jesus will give you what you need. Bring to him your problem this morning. Bring to him your problem this morning. Bring to him what is burdening you this morning. What, don't leave this place with the same burden in your heart. And it applies to everything in our lives, brothers and sisters, anything. Do not allow yourself to walk out of this room today and continue to worry about the same things. Continue to, to, to carry the same kind of bitterness against people in the church. Continue in the same path. I said this before, and, and I, I will continue to say this in messages in the future. God is trying to teach us to entrust ourselves to Him and to throw our cares, to cast our cares upon Him. This morning, whatever is in your heart, wherever you are, can you come to Jesus this morning? Can you speak to Him? Can you reconcile with that brother? These things, imagine building a wall. You know, Brother Sam can build a wall you will probably be very good at it, I think. But build a wall. But as he's building, I start loading his back with weights. He's loading it. He, after a while, he's not going to be able to do anything because of what he's carrying. You know, the book of Hebrews 11 says what? Throw off or cast off every weight, extra weight that you're carrying. And the, the, the sin that you're so easily tangled, but that weight that you're carrying in your life, throw it off because you cannot run this race with carrying these burdens in your life. Come to Jesus this morning. I want to give people an opportunity this morning to come forward. If, if there's a burden that you need to unload this morning, maybe, maybe even... People in marriage, you know, if there's marriage things, come this morning. Come whatever it is. Things that has, has been burdening you for such a long time. Anxiety, whatever, fear. I, I want the Lord, He's the comforter, to minister to you this morning. When I was in, in prayer this morning, I felt this very strongly in my heart. That He wants to comfort us this morning. He is our comforter. Amen. He's the one who can minister to you. But Jesus says in Matthew 11, come to me. Come to me. If you're, if you're heavy laden, if you come to me, I can give you rest. The song that Amelia sang, she said, I am restless. What? If I'm not with you, I'm, I'm restless. That's the song that she sang. This rest that you seek these burdens that has been burdening you for so long, such a long time, throw them off because they are hindering God's work in your life, God's work in, in, in the church. Let us see that the Lord, He gives us a yoke. It's only His yoke that we are called to carry. And His commandments are not burdensome. They are life to us. They, are, they produce joy in us. And... 
I want to, when we come in here, I want there to be rejoicing. I don't want people to always be heavy. Every prayer meeting, every to be heavy-hearted. Come, whatever is in your heart, bring it to Jesus this morning.